Welcome to the RPTM Podcast, the show that breaks down the myths of monolithic history and tells our story through multiple lenses. I'm your host, Professor Ryan Lancaster. Today's episode is partially underwritten by you, the listener. Find out ways to support the podcast on the website, ryanglancaster.com. Episode 44, The American Civil War, Part 1. We all have biases and blind spots, historians and professors alike. You've already seen my penchant for pirates and dinosaurs in previous lectures, but here's another glaring one, the American Civil War. The characters seem larger than life, the battles epic, the struggles grandiose, and almost Shakespearean. I see almost to glorify the entire event as some 19th century Greek tragedy. Does it have the makings of a Hollywood blockbuster? Political intrigue? Check. Action and adventure? Check. A robust cast of characters? Check. Sex, drugs, and violence? Check. You can almost imagine the movie poster right now glorifying how high the stakes are. The fate of the free world hangs in the balance. War is a notion that should never be lauded. But as you have most likely gathered, the truth is muddier and murkier than a film. The American Civil War is just that, a war. Gallons upon gallons of blood were spilled all over our terrain. Vultures picked the bones of our fellow citizens, and mothers and wives mourned the senseless deaths of their sons and husbands. As the dust settled, over half a million Americans were dead. Yet I can't seem to f- help myself regardless. Being so far removed from the bloodshed and its ramifications, I can't help but feel we do a disservice to the past when we run events through a disenfranchised antiseptic scope. In a scene from the 1935 classic horror film Bride of Frankenstein, the character Dr. Pretorius toasts Dr. Frankenstein, quote, to a new world of gods and monsters. And that is what the Civil War is to me. Gods and monsters. The Caning of Charles Sumner The caning of Charles Sumner, or the Brooks Sumner Affair, occurred on May 22, 1856, in the United States Senate Chamber, when Representative Preston Brooks, a pro-slavery Democrat from South Carolina, used a walking cane to attack Senator Charles Sumner, an abolitionist Republican from Massachusetts. The attack was in retaliation for a speech given by Sumner two days earlier in which he fiercely criticized slaveholders, including South Carolina Senator Andrew Butler, a relative of Brooks. The beating nearly killed Sumner and contributed significantly to the country's polarization over the issue of slavery. It has been considered symbolic of the breakdown of reasoned discourse and the use of violence that eventually led to the Civil War. In 1856, during the bleeding Kansas crisis, Sumner denounced the Kansas-Nebraska Act in his Crime Against Kansas speech, delivered on May 19 and 20. The extended address argued for the immediate admission of Kansas as a free state and denounced the slave power. Sumner then attacked the act's authors, Senators Stephen A. Douglas of Illinois and Andrew Butler of South Carolina. In addition, Sumner mocked Butler's speaking ability, which a recent stroke had impeded. Sumner had been ridiculed and insulted by both Douglas and Butler for his opposition to the Fugitive Slave Law and the Kansas-Nebraska Act, with Butler crudely race-baiting Sumner by making sexual allusions to black women, like many slaveholders who accused abolitionists of promoting interracial marriage. Sexually charged accusations were also part of the abolitionist lexicon. It is also important to note the sexual imagery that recurred throughout Sumner's oration, which was neither accidental nor without precedent. Abolitionists routinely accused slaveholders of maintaining slavery so that they could engage in forcible sexual relations with their slaves. Douglas said during the speech that this damn fool is going to get himself killed by some other damn fool. Representative Preston Brooks, Butler's first cousin once removed, was infuriated. 
He later said he intended to challenge Sumner to a duel and consulted with fellow South Carolina Representative Lawrence M. Keat on dueling etiquette. Keat told him that dueling was for gentlemen of equal social standing and that Sumner was no better than a drunkard due to the supposedly coarse language during his speech. Brooks said that he concluded that since Sumner was no gentleman, he did not merit proper treatment, to Keat and Brooks, it was more appropriate to humiliate Sumner by beating him with a cane in a public setting. Two days later, on May 22, 1856, Brooks entered the Senate chamber with Keat and another ally, Representative Henry A. Edmondson of Virginia. They waited for the galleries to clear, being particularly concerned that there be no ladies present to witness what Brooks intended to do. He confronted Sumner while writing at his desk in the almost empty Senate chamber. As Sumner began to stand up, Brooks beat Sumner severely on the head before he could reach his feet, using a thick cane with a gold head. The force of the blows shocked Sumner that he immediately lost sight. Sumner was knocked down and trapped under the heavy desk bolted to the floor. His chair, which was pulled up to his desk, moved back and forth on a track, Sumner either could not or did not think to slide his chair around to escape, so it pinned him under his desk. Brooks continued to strike Sumner until Sumner rose to his feet and ripped the desk from the floor to get away from Brooks. Brooks grabbed the falling Sumner, held him up by the lapel with one hand, and continued lashing at him with the cane in the other. By this time, Sumner was blinded by his blood. He staggered up the aisle and vainly attempted to defend himself, arms outstretched. But then, he was an even larger and more accessible target for Brooks, who continued to beat him across the head, face, and shoulders to the full extent of his power. Brooks did not stop when his cane snapped, he continued thrashing Sumner with the piece that held the gold head. Near the end of the attack, Sumner collapsed unconscious, although shortly before succumbing, he bellowed like a calf, according to Brooks. Several other senators and representatives attempted to help Sumner. Still, they were blocked by Edmondson, who yelled at the spectators to leave Brooks and Sumner alone, and Keat, who brandished his cane and a pistol and shouted to let them be. Representatives Ambrose S. Murray and Edwin B. Morgan were finally able to intervene and restrain Brooks, at which point he quietly left the chamber. The cane Brooks used was broken into several pieces, which he went on the blood-soaked floor of the Senate chamber. Sumner became a martyr in the North and Brooks a hero in the South. The episode revealed the polarization in America, which had now reached the floor of the Senate. Northerners were outraged. Thousands attended rallies supporting Sumner in Boston, Albany, Cleveland, Detroit, New Haven, New York, and Providence. Supporters distributed more than a million copies of Sumner's speech. Conversely, Brooks was praised by Southern newspapers. Southerners sent Brooks hundreds of new canes in endorsement of his assault. One was inscribed hit him again. Massachusetts Representative Anson Burlingame publicly humiliated Brooks by goading him into challenging Burlingame to a duel, only to set conditions designed to intimidate Brooks into backing down. As the challenged party, Burlingame, a crack shot, had the choice of weapons and dueling ground. He selected rifles on the Canadian side of Niagara Falls, where U.S. anti-dueling laws would not apply. Brooks withdrew his challenge, claiming he did not want to expose himself to the risk of violence by traveling through northern states to get to Niagara Falls. Southerners mocked Sumner, claiming he was faking his injuries. They argued that the cane Brooks used was not heavy enough to inflict severe injuries. They also claimed that Brooks had not hit Sumner more than a few times and had not hit him hard enough to cause serious health concerns. Sumner suffered head trauma that caused him chronic, debilitating pain for the rest of his life and symptoms consistent with what is now called traumatic brain injury and post-traumatic stress disorder, he spent three years convalescing before returning to his Senate seat. Massachusetts pointedly did not replace him, not even temporarily, and left his empty desk in the Senate as a visible reminder of the incident. The voters of Massachusetts re-elected him in 1858, even though he could not take his seat. Brooks claimed that he had not intended to kill Sumner, or he would have used a different weapon. In a speech to the House defending his actions, Brooks stated that he meant no disrespect to the Senate of the United States or the House by his attack on Sumner. Brooks was arrested for the assault. He was tried in a District of Columbia court, 
convicted, and fined $300, $9,050 in today's dollars, but received no prison sentence. In the 1856 elections, the new Republican Party made gains by using the twin messages of bleeding Kansas and bleeding Sumner because both events painted pro-slavery Democrats as extremists. Though the Democrats won the presidential election and increased their majority in the House of Representatives because the three-fifth compromise gave Democrats an advantage, Republicans made dramatic gains in elections for the state legislatures, which enabled them to make gains in the U.S. Senate elections because the state legislatures chose senators. The violence in Kansas and the beating of Sumner helped the Republicans coalesce and cohere as a party, setting the stage for their victory in the 1860 presidential election. Slavery and the Civil War Slavery was the leading cause of disunion. Slavery had been a controversial issue during the framing of the Constitution but had been left unsettled. The point of slavery had confounded the nation since its inception and increasingly separated the United States into a slaveholding South and a free North. The issue was exacerbated by the rapid territorial expansion of the country, which repeatedly brought to the fore the issue of whether the new territory should be slaveholding or free. The case had dominated politics for decades leading up to the war. Critical attempts to solve the issue included the Missouri Compromise and the Compromise of 1850, but these only postponed an inevitable showdown over slavery. The motivations of the average person were not inherently those of their faction, some northern soldiers were even indifferent about slavery, but historians can establish a general pattern. Confederate soldiers fought the war primarily to protect a southern society of which slavery was an integral part. From the anti-slavery perspective, the issue was mainly whether slavery was an anachronistic evil incompatible with republicanism. The strategy of the anti-slavery forces was containment, to stop the expansion of slavery and thereby put it on a path to ultimate extinction. The slaveholding interests in the South denounced this strategy as infringing upon their constitutional rights. Southern whites believed the emancipation of enslaved people would destroy the South's economy due to a large amount of capital invested in enslaved people and fears of integrating the ex-slave black population. In particular, many Southerners feared a repeat of the 1804 Haiti massacre, also known as the Horrors of Santo Domingo, in which formerly enslaved people systematically murdered most of what was left of the country's white population, including men, women, children, and even many sympathetic to abolition, after the successful slave revolt in Haiti. Historian Thomas Fleming points to the historical phrase a disease and the public mind used by critics of this idea and proposes it contributed to the segregation in the Jim Crow era following emancipation. These fears were exacerbated by the 1859 attempt of John Brown to instigate an armed slave rebellion in the South. The abolitionists, those advocating the end of slavery, were active in the decades leading up to the Civil War. They traced their philosophical roots back to the Puritans, who firmly believed slavery was morally wrong. One of the early Puritan writings on this subject was The Selling of Joseph, by Samuel Sewell in 1700. Sewell condemned slavery and the slave trade and refuted many of the era's typical justifications for slavery. Whig Party became increasingly opposed to slavery because it saw it as inherently against the ideals of capitalism and the free market. The abolitionist sentiment was not strictly religious or moral in origin. Whig leader William H. Seward proclaimed an irrepressible conflict between slavery and free labor. That slavery had left the South backward and undeveloped. As the Whig party dissolved in the 1850s, the mantle of abolition fell to its newly formed successor, the Republican Party. Manifest destiny heightened the conflict over slavery, as each new territory acquired faced the thorny question of whether to allow or disallow the peculiar institution. Between 1803 and 1854, the United States achieved a vast expansion of territory through purchase, negotiation, and conquest. At first, the new states carved out of these territories entering the Union were apportioned equally between enslaved people and free states. Pro- and anti-slavery forces collided over the regions west of the Mississippi. A long-running dispute over the origin of the Civil War is to what extent states' rights triggered the conflict. The consensus among historians is that the Civil War was not fought about states' rights but the issue is frequently referenced in popular accounts of the war and has much traction among Southerners. 
The South argued that just as each state had decided to join the Union, a state had the right to secede, leave the Union, at any time. Northerners rejected that notion as opposed to the will of the Founding Fathers, who said they were setting up a perpetual Union. Historians point out that even if Confederates genuinely fought over states' rights, it boiled down to states' right to slavery. The election of Abraham Lincoln in November 1860 was the final trigger for secession. Efforts at compromise, including the Corwin Amendment and the Crittenden Compromise, failed. Southern leaders feared that Lincoln would stop the expansion of slavery and put it on a course toward extinction. When Lincoln won the presidential election in 1860, the South lost any hope of compromise. Jefferson Davis claimed that all the cotton states would secede from the Union. The Confederacy formed from seven states of the Deep South, Alabama, Florida, Georgia, Louisiana, Mississippi, South Carolina, and Texas in January and February 1861. They wrote the Confederate Constitution, which provided more significant states' rights than the Constitution of the United States. Until elections were held, Davis was the provisional president. Lincoln was inaugurated on March 4, 1861. The American Civil War The Civil War in the United States began in 1861, after decades of simmering tensions between northern and southern states over slavery. The election of Abraham Lincoln in 1860 caused seven southern states to secede and form the Confederate States of America, four more states soon joined them. As the Civil War was also known, the war between the states ended in the Confederate surrender in 1865. The conflict was the costliest and deadliest war ever fought on American soil, with some 620,000 of 2.4 million soldiers killed, millions more injured, and much of the South left in ruin. In the mid-19th century, while the United States was experiencing an era of tremendous growth, a fundamental economic difference existed between the country's northern and southern regions. In the North, manufacturing and industry were well established, and agriculture was mostly limited to small-scale farms. At the same time, the South's economy was based on a system of large-scale farming that depended on the labor of black enslaved people to grow certain crops, especially cotton and tobacco. Growing abolitionist sentiment in the North after the 1830s and Northern opposition to slavery's extension into the new Western territories led many Southerners to fear that the existence of slavery in America, and thus the backbone of their economy, was in danger. In 1854, the U.S. Congress passed the Kansas-Nebraska Act, which essentially opened all new territories to slavery by asserting the rule of popular sovereignty over congressional edict. Pro- and anti-slavery forces struggled violently in bleeding Kansas. At the same time, opposition to the Act in the North led to the formation of the Republican Party, a new political entity based on the principle of opposing slavery's extension into the Western territories. After the Supreme Court's ruling in the Dred Scott case confirmed the legality of slavery in the territories, the abolitionist John Brown's raid at Harper's Ferry in 1859 convinced more and more Southerners that their northern neighbors were bent on the destruction of the peculiar institution that sustained them. Abraham Lincoln's election in November 1860 was the final straw. Within three months, seven southern states South Carolina, Mississippi, Florida, Alabama, Georgia, Louisiana, and Texas had seceded from the United States. Even as Lincoln took office in March 1861, Confederate forces threatened the Federal-held Fort Sumter in Charleston, South Carolina. On April 12, after Lincoln ordered a fleet to resupply Sumter, Confederate artillery fired the first shots of the Civil War. Sumter's commander, Major Robert Anderson, surrendered after less than two days of bombardment, leaving the fort in the hands of Confederate forces under Pierre G. T. Beauregard. Four more southern states Virginia, Arkansas, North Carolina, and Tennessee joined the Confederacy after Fort Sumter. Border slave states like Missouri, Kentucky, and Maryland did not secede, but there was much Confederate sympathy among their citizens. Though on the surface the Civil War may have seemed a lopsided conflict, with the 23 states of the Union enjoying an enormous advantage in population, manufacturing, and railroad construction, the Confederates had a strong military tradition, along with some of the best soldiers and commanders in the nation. They also had a cause they believed in, preserving their long-held traditions and institutions, chief among these being slavery. 
In the first Battle of Bull Run on July 21, 1861, 35,000 Confederate soldiers under the command of Thomas Jonathan Stonewall Jackson forced a more significant number of Union forces to retreat towards Washington, D.C., dashing any hopes of a quick Union victory and leading Lincoln to call for 500,000 more recruits. Both sides' initial call for troops widened after it became clear that the war would not be a limited or short conflict. George B. McClellan who replaced the aging General Winfield Scott as Supreme Commander of the Union Army after the first months of the war was beloved by his troops, but his reluctance to advance frustrated Lincoln. In 1862, McClellan finally led his Army of the Potomac up the peninsula between the York and James Rivers, capturing Yorktown on May 4. The combined forces of Robert E. Lee and Jackson successfully drove back McClellan's army in the Seven Days Battles, and a cautious McClellan called for yet more reinforcements to move against Richmond. Lincoln refused and instead withdrew the Army of the Potomac to Washington. By 1862, McClellan had been replaced as Union General-in-Chief by Henry W. Halleck, though he remained in command of the Army of the Potomac. On August 29, Union troops led by John Pope struck Jackson's forces in the Second Battle of Bull Run. The next day, Lee hit the Federal left flank with a massive assault, driving Pope's men back towards Washington. Lee then moved his troops northwards and split his men, sending Jackson to meet Pope's forces near Manassas, while Lee himself moved separately with the second half of the army. On the heels of his victory at Manassas, Lee began the first Confederate invasion of the North. Despite contradictory orders from Lincoln and Halleck, McClellan was able to reorganize his army and strike at Lee on September 14 in Maryland, driving the Confederates back to a defensive position along Antietam Creek, near Sharpsburg. On September 17, the Army of the Potomac hit Lee's forces in what became the war's bloodiest single day of fighting. Total casualties at the Battle of Antietam numbered 12,410 of some 69,000 troops on the Union side and 13,724 of around 52,000 for the Confederates. The Union victory at Antietam would prove decisive, as it halted the Confederate advance in Maryland and forced Lee to retreat into Virginia. Still, McClellan's failure to pursue his advantage earned him the scorn of Lincoln and Halleck, who removed him from command in favor of Ambrose E. Burnside. Burnside's assault on Lee's troops near Fredericksburg on December 13 ended in heavy Union casualties and a Confederate victory, he was promptly replaced by Joseph fighting Joe Hooker, and both armies settled into winter quarters across the Rappahannock River from each other. Lincoln had used the occasion of the Union victory at Antietam to issue a preliminary emancipation proclamation, which freed all enslaved people in the rebellious states after January 1, 1863. He justified his decision as a wartime measure and did not go so far as to free the enslaved people in the border states loyal to the Union. Still, the Emancipation Proclamation deprived the Confederacy of the bulk of its labor forces and put international public opinion firmly on the Union side. Some 186,000 black Civil War soldiers would join the Union Army when the war ended in 1865, and 38,000 lost their lives. In the spring of 1863, Hooker's plans for a Union offensive were thwarted by a surprise attack by the bulk of Lee's forces on May 1, at which point Hooker pulled his men back to Chancellorsville. The Confederates gained a costly victory in Chancellorsville, suffering 13,000 casualties, the Union lost 17,000 men. In June, Lee launched another invasion of the North, attacking Union forces commanded by General George Meade on July 1 near Gettysburg, in southern Pennsylvania. Over three days of fierce fighting, the Confederates could not push through the Union center and suffered close to 60% casualties. Meade failed to counterattack, however, and Lee's remaining forces were able to escape into Virginia, ending the last Confederate invasion of the North. Also, in July 1863, Union forces under Ulysses S. Grant took Vicksburg, Mississippi in the Siege of Vicksburg, a victory that would prove to be the turning point of the war in the Western theater. After a Confederate success at Chickamauga Creek, Georgia, just south of Chattanooga, Tennessee, Lincoln expanded Grant's command in September. He led a reinforced Federal Army to victory in the Battle of Chattanooga in late November. In March 1864, Lincoln put Grant in supreme command of the Union armies, replacing Halleck. Leaving William Tecumseh Sherman in control in the West, Grant headed to Washington, where he led the Army of the Potomac towards Lee's troops in Northern Virginia. 
Despite heavy Union casualties in the Battle of the Wilderness, and at Spotsylvania, at Cold Harbor, and the key rail center of Petersburg, Grant pursued a strategy of attrition, putting Petersburg under siege for the next nine months. Sherman outmaneuvered Confederate forces to take Atlanta by September. He and some 60,000 Union troops began the famous march to the sea, devastating Georgia to capture Savannah on December 21. Columbia and Charleston, South Carolina, fell to Sherman's men by mid-February. Jefferson Davis belatedly handed over the supreme command to Lee, with the Confederate war effort on its last legs. Sherman pressed on through North Carolina, capturing Fayetteville, Bentonville, Goldsboro, and Raleigh by mid-April. Meanwhile, exhausted by the Union siege of Petersburg and Richmond, Lee's forces made a last attempt at resistance, attacking and capturing the federal-controlled fort, Stedman on March 25. However, an immediate counterattack reversed the victory, and on the night of April 2 to the 3rd, Lee's forces evacuated Richmond. For most of the next week, Grant and Meade pursued the Confederates along the Appomattox River, finally exhausting their possibilities for escape. Grant accepted Lee's surrender at Appomattox Courthouse on April 9. On the eve of victory, the Union lost its great leader, American and Confederate sympathizer John Wilkes Booth assassinated President Lincoln at Ford's Theater in Washington on April 14. Sherman received Johnston's surrender at Durham Station, North Carolina, on April 26, effectively ending the Civil War. You've been listening to the RPTM podcast. If you like what you hear, please rate us on whatever platform you're listening on. Join us again next week when we talk about the seen and unseen of U.S. history. Make sure you subscribe to the podcast so you never miss an episode. Also, for more information, check out the show notes on my website. The show was produced by me. Our editor is me. Written and researched by me. Music is Down South by Bliv Beats. I'm Ryan Lancaster, and this was the RPTM Podcast.